Steph, what the kachuk is going on in Calgary? <laughs> Lots of bad things are going on in Calgary. Lots first, of bad things. First, Johnny Gaudreau is gone. Then Matthew Kachuk is gone. We'll talk about these piecemeal. But start me off. Did you see Johnny Gaudreau getting an $8 million deal from the Cal- $10 million deals at eight years from the Calgary Flames, turning that down, then going a $10 million deal north of $10 million to New Jersey, turning that down over seven years? then getting north of $12 million from the Columbus Blue Jackets at seven years, turning that down, and then signing with the Columbus Blue Jackets, taking your own pay cut at 9.8. I didn't see that maze of a situation, but I I definitely saw him leaving. I didn't. I, I wasn't convinced he was going to stick around in Calgary, even if that decision did take him, you know, as long as it took him to make. He was until, like, the basically the last day, you know, of, of, sorry, last day before free agency, said he was still making his decision, which I believe, but I always kind of saw that he wasn't going to stick around. He just seems like that type of guy who doesn't want to play in a Canadian market, who wants to play in a sort of low-key market. He got the money that he was looking for. Granted, like you said, he took a pay cut, interestingly enough, but I kind of think this makes sense for the type of person that he seems like he is. Well, like when I think of this deal, I mean, in general for a UFA, I'm either thinking they care about money, they care about playing closer to home, or they care about winning. And when we look at this for the Johnny Goudreau contract, literally none of this makes sense. First and foremost, it could not have been money. We just said he turned down a deal from the New Jersey Devils that was almost a million and a bit more AAV. Then he turned down, he gave himself a pay cut to Columbus. It clearly wasn't that. Then when we go to playing at home, I mean, he had the chance to play in the state that he grew up in chose to instead play in a state that was five to six hours away by car. Um, so clearly couldn't have been wanting to play at home. And then lastly is winning. Like, unless I'm delusional, when you look at Johnny Gaudreau versus Patrick and Patrick Laine on the Columbus Blue Jackets, after that, their depth falls off a cliff. And when you compare this to the New Jersey Devils, who quite possibly have one of the best one-two punches down the middle in Heischer and Hughes, pretty good winger depth in Jesper Bratt, a great starting defensive core in um, Dougie Hamilton and Simon Nemec, and then Vanacek and Net. That team is way like they're exponentially higher, have a higher probability of winning the cup within the next three to five years. If it wasn't any of these, like, please tell me what, what's the rationale for him signing there? I I alluded to it. I I just think he's a unique person. Like he like clearly he's unique because all those things you said make sense. That like guys would want either money or or all three of these to be closer to home or to win. I just think he doesn't really think that way. Clearly, winning wasn't a huge priority for him. I think he made a what was clearly a lifestyle decision, a family-based decision. And I don't mean necessarily his his immediate family in terms of like his parents and whatnot. I think his family, like his his own family now, with his with his wife who's expecting a child. I also think he he mentioned this on an episode, the most recent episode of Spin Checklist. He went on there and he said. Columbus was good because Columbus isn't too far away from home where that they could still see family regularly. But it also was it gave him that, that little bit of distance, that separation where he could sort of do his own thing. I, I kind of I, I kind of understand that. Like I would always, of course, want to be close to my parents. But would you want to live for like all intents and purposes? Calgary, moving from Calgary to New Jersey would be like you living right next door to your parents. Like, would you would you want to do that when you're about to raise a family like we both love our families and they listen to the show so yeah we love you guys but i need i need maybe a 10 minute drive away from my family so i can get that distance that way when i spend time with them i actually enjoy it yeah that 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 is very true i mean if my parents are listening to this i mean i love you too but i'm not trying to live next door exactly that does make sense but i mean it just makes this so much more confusing when it's the Columbus Blue Jackets. Like, yeah. you know, I'm not a geo geo wizard, so correct me if I'm wrong. But the New York Islanders are also close, but no, not close enough to yeah. New Jersey. And yeah. he would have the chance there to play with a first line center and Matthew Barzell. Why not the Islanders? Yeah, that's no that that one that one makes it a bit of a head scratcher, um, because they were you know, up until like the day of, like they were they were in conversations. Their name was being thrown around. 
maybe there's like a New Jersey beef. They were New Jersey, like New Jersey people don't like Long Island people. Like, I actually don't know if that's a thing. I also wonder if maybe Lou had something to do with this. Maybe. I, I don't, I, mean, I haven't heard much about that in general. And I definitely haven't heard that being reported um, because Lou doesn't let that kind of stuff get out. But I just wonder if the no the no beard, the no long hair, the the super sort of military style that he runs, which granted works, maybe just Gaudreau, like you know the the dude that he is, just like no, I'd rather go play in Columbus, and I'd rather be way out of the spotlight and not have to conform to this sort of you know system that they work with in the island. That's pure speculation. That's just something I'm trying to like reason through in my head as to why the uh, the island wouldn't have been an option. But that's the only thing that I can really think of because on the ice, like you said. New coach who's going to be, you know, you can't be less offensive than Barry Trot. So he still would have gotten his cookies in terms of points and stuff. Mm -hmm. They're closer to winning. Like, they're a great team. They're going to be competitive again this year. So it must have been some sort of off the ice thing that it didn't sort of jive with them. Yeah, if I'm a Calgary Flames fan, hearing what Johnny Goudreau said today to the press um, hurts. It cuts really deep. Like he said, for what it's worth, I didn't know until the very end like within the last few days of signing that contract that I wanted to leave. Like they were close mm -hmm. to getting him. And on one hand, a lot of free agents will say this just to seem kind of, you know, respectable in the public eye, but he seemed very genuine when he, he said did, it. Yeah. And also he did make it clear that last year he wanted to resign. Like him and his wife, um, he said actively wanted to start a family in Calgary and wanted to resign. And I guess the front office didn't feel like resigning at that time was a good idea. Mm -hmm. Then Johnny Goudreau has an insane contract here yeah. and now doesn't want to sign back. So, I mean, I guess it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't in the cards. Yeah. But what really, really stands out to me is that the Johnny Goudreau signing um, had a lot of contingency for the Calgary Flames in terms of their future success. Not only because sure. they lose a 115-point player, but because now Matthew Kachuk says he doesn't want to sign long-term. Yeah. I think last year only eight players in the NHL had over 100 points and Calgary just lost two of them that play on the same line. I, I did some very easy math that I know um, some people on TikTok are a little afraid of when it comes to hockey, but 29% of Calgary's goals last year were scored by those two and they're both gone. Like this team's not going to be able to score. There's going to be no more power play. The Oilers legitimately put them into a rebuild. Yeah, in the, in the matter of a week, they literally saw the trajectory of their franchise take like a take a one eighty. I I don't understand. Matthew Kachuk came out today and said that he's really only willing to sign with St. Louis, Dallas, Nashville, Vegas, and Florida, mm -hmm. um, in their teams of long term. He said he wasn't happy with Trey Living not signing back Johnny Gaudreau. But I mean, what more do you want the GM to do? Yeah. He he offered quite possibly a franchise decimating contract to that player. I mean, ah. Maybe it could, it could be like whenever you offer double digits to a guy, you got to be sure that right. they're going to be performing to that level. Then Matthew Kachuk rejects captaincy. Like he, like he said, he didn't want to be the captain of the Calgary Flames. I mean, what do you make of the Matthew Kachuk situation? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough week for Ottawa. <laughs> tough week. Not Ottawa. Sorry. Calgary. Um, I'm honestly not that shocked. Similar to Goudreau, but for different reasons. I, I, I always, I, I didn't envision a world where he was leaving, but I, I would I would never have been shocked if he had left. You know, um, he just seems like the kind of guy who wants to go where he wants to go. And th this isn't really a knock on him. It's just he wanted to go, and now he has leverage to go where he wants to go. And the fact that his line mate, who definitely was a big part of him scoring 100 points, is leaving, it makes that decision a lot easier for him to make. And I also think having a guy already leave from a PR perspective, it's like you kind of you're kind of sharing the hatred, and it's not like imagine if Goodrow signs and then he's like, okay, I'm an RFA. I, if I leave now, or if I kind of make this kind of scene now, I'm going to be hated ten times more. It might be a bad look around the league too. Mm -hmm. This was his opportunity to exert the leverage that he has, and he's he's making you know no no sort of hesitation in in using it. I mean, yeah, that's a really good point. It might have made um, the blow a little bit softer yeah. now that Johnny Goodrow doesn't resign back and. Um, it came out a couple days ago that the St. Louis Blues offered the Calgary Flames Jordan Cairo, Tory Krug, and a first, and they turned it down. That was before um, Johnny Gaudreau didn't sign back. That was also before Calgary went into arbitration with Matthew Kachuk. So I wonder if they're going to get a package that good. And I'll be honest, at first, when I looked at that package, I thought it was more than commensurate for Matthew Kachuk. But you kind of talked me into um, that deal being too one-sided for the St. Louis yeah. Blues. When you look at these stats, like let's not get it twisted. Matthew Kachuk at 24 years old is a 91% percent 
expected war among all forwards in the league. He's in the 98th percentile of expected offense. He's one of the best two-way forwards in the league at a 93rd percent expected percentile in all defensive metrics. He adds insane grit to any NHL team. And Mm -hmm. we've talked about this a lot on this podcast. Like There are very few players in this league that offer you both um, grit, um, strength and scoring in one player. Like the names that come to mind are honestly Kachuk and his brother, Landis Goggovechkin. Am I missing anybody? Maybe Tom Wilson, but he's not even that offensively talented as these guys. Right? So, I mean, Matthew Kachuk is so valuable to any team that yeah, wants to well. make a playoff push. He performed well enough this year, too. This is just such a blow to the Calgary Flames. Like, I wonder what a package for Matthew Kachuk would have to be for them to accept it. I think on on paper, you would have to be willing to give up a very good NHL player, like a Jordan Cairo, mm-hmm. I, another young prospect. It would probably be similar to what the Buffalo got for for Eichel, but maybe even better because um, Eichel had a, not a lot of leverage, but he, he Eichel didn't have leverage rather, but his, his health concerns sort of maybe decrease his value a little bit. But Matthew Kachuk is in the, really the prime of his career and coming off of a career year so i think his price is higher by name by like just because of that but i think it's gonna look similar a very good nhler who's young um a good prospect and at least one first if not if not another like i think there was a second in the eichel trade in addition to the first a prospect and the player i think you're looking at that at bare minimum but given what he's come out and said he's just like yeah these five to six teams are the only ones i want to sign long term to that basically cuts out, I don't know, like 75 to 80% of the league. So now you're dealing with these six teams. These teams, they have leverage. And they're saying, listen, I have this cap space to sign them. I'm one I'm like one of six teams that can sign them because I have the cap space, let's say. So this is what I'm going to offer you. You really don't have a choice but to take it. And on top of that, Calgary gave themselves a deadline because they have to get this deal done before arbitration or else he's sticking around for the year. Yeah, I mean, th- those are all really good points. And when you put those all together, you start to think like, Matthew Kachuk is not going to be a flame next year. If I had to ask you right now where you would put your money, if um, what jersey he's wearing next year, who would that be? I, I kind of like the idea of him going to Nashville. Really? Yeah, I think Duchesne and, and Forsberg, who just signed, coming off career years. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, we talked a lot about, about lifestyle with Johnny Gaudreau. I think it's different for Matthew Kachuk. He seems like a guy who likes to be in the big market. Nashville is a very big market, sort of like, really fits well with bigger personalities um temperatures the climate's good it's a state free tax it's a tax-free state rather um and they have the cap space to do it too if they i'm assuming whoever they trade out to get them you, you you gain that cap and then you're sitting with i think they're sitting with close to 10 at that point so they definitely have the money to make it happen david poyle is also a guy who's not afraid to make a big trade he's done it in the past mm-hmm. and he's also getting to the point where he was really desperate to compete. He's an older GM. I don't see him sticking around for much longer. So this could be that type of move where it's like, this is my like my my, my last bullet to 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 shoot, let's say, and to get a cup. That team has struggled to score in the past. They got two of the best careers out. They got two of the best seasons out of Duchesne and Forsberg. If you add another guy who got a hundred points, I, I they're very. I think they become a, a pretty damn good team at that point. Yeah, not even that. They have a a sneaky good um defensive pairing and i mean obviously roman yossi there's nothing sneaky about him he's phenomenal but i mean ekholm and carrier one of the better shutdown defensive yeah. pairs in the league you see soros as a vesna candidate if he plays well and he was this year they have a decent little foundation there yeah that that's that's a sneaky good pick i would say next uh, honestly nashville sounds really good if it wasn't nashville i'm thinking the st louis blues yeah. the reason why i say that is because you taught me today he is from st louis mm-hmm. um that's where he was raised not only that the st louis blues play matthew kachuk style hockey yeah. they are an incredibly like power forward strength te- checking team that plays two way like ryan o'reilly as the captain of a team you know you better be playing exactly. two way or else you're not playing the, the st louis blues also look like or not look like they've shown they've proven that they are willing to give up prime assets for matthew kachuk in jordan Cairo. i wonder if trey living said you do that same deal but you put robert thomas instead of Cairo if they Ooh. make that deal it would be tight that would be tough it would be tight but one thing i'm thinking is that i wonder why one team on my mind that wasn't on this list of Matthew Kachuk signing long-term was where his brother's currently playing. Yeah. With all the moves that the Ottawa Senators made this year, I wonder why he wouldn't want to sign like a four- or five-year deal, at least play with his brother while his brother's still in those RFA years, and he's playing on a team that could compete for a cup. 
on, on paper, that, that's a, a perfect destination for him, an up-and-coming team that will have the money to sign him. They have the assets to trade for him. I just think that, and, and you're going to, and this leads into you know a bit of a point that you've been making to me, which I think makes sense that you want to repeat on on the podcast. But it's on the wrong side of the border. It's they're Canadian. Yeah, I mean that's true. I mean, yeah, we're starting to see. We're going to talk about this pretty soon. But before we do that, I'm just thinking that if Ottawa were even to start making this trade, like if you are, who's the owner, who's the GM of the Ottawa Senators, Pierre Dorian. If you're Pierre Dorian and Trevling offers you, he says, "I'll give you Matthew Kachuk for like." Batherson, Stutzla in a first. Would you would you do it? I would I would definitely feel comfortable including Batherson, even though he's fantastic, but you have like he him or Akaru, very similar type of player, like very good wingers. I would be hesitant to get rid of Stutzla just because he he's the third round third overall pick from like a year or two ago. He's still so good. I would feel comfortable giving a Batherson a first and then maybe they could maybe have another pick of one of our other prospects. But like I think I think you have the the basis of a trade right there. Yeah, maybe Matthew just doesn't want to play in a team where his brother's the captain. That'd be so his younger brother too at that'd, that. That'd be kind of funny. Yeah. But okay, so we talked about this. We we were seeing a trend now where big time UFAs, even RFAs that are American born and Johnny Gaudreau and Matthew Kachuk are starting to walk away from Canadian teams that are offering big time contracts, like more than any other team would be offering them. Um, and I don't want to say quite clearly, but it seems presumably because they're on the north side of the 49th parallel and these players want to play in the States. Yeah. The reason why I say this is because I'm brainstorming now. And is there a single American born player for a Canadian team right now that signed a big UFA deal to want to play in Canada? I can't think of any significant moves. There's definitely been some like third and fourth liners, but they're obviously just going to take the money wherever they can get it kind of thing. But I don't know if a guy who literally had his pick of the litter, I can't think of somebody off the top of my head. I'm sure maybe we're missing a couple, but even if there are a couple, that's that's kind of right in line with the point you're trying to make here. Yeah, the, the reason why I'm trying to make this point is because in roughly two years, um, quite possibly the best, or I think the best American-born player ever is going to be a UFA. And if this trend continues, if I am Kyle Dubas, in a year and a half from now, I'm starting. I'm going to sit Austin Matthews down um, in a private boardroom and explicitly learn his intentions. Because there, if there is even a hint that Austin Matthews wants to test free agency, I mean, you cannot let him walk when you could presumably get like four first-round picks for him. Yeah, that's... That's that would be such a tough decision, because as Kyle Dubas, you're thinking, yeah, okay, do I let him walk away for and get nothing, or do I trade him a year before, like a year, you know, earlier than I would have to lose him otherwise, and then potentially not win that trade because he's going to exert similar leverage to a Matthew Kachuk here. That's just such a tough decision. I would not envy being in Dubas's position. If that were to come up, if he's like he sits him down and he's, Matthew says, "Yeah, okay, maybe I want to leave coming up here," that that scares me as a Leafs fan because I, I think Dubas is in a lose lose situation there, right? You you either you have to keep him and hope you win a cup because if you lose if you don't win the cup and you lose him in the same off season, that's franchise decimating like you know kiss our cup window goodbye. Mm-hmm. And then also if you trade him and the trade doesn't work out or you get a very poor return and your team isn't competitive after that, then you're also going to look like a bad guy. Like, you are in a lose-lose situation at that point. I think Kyle Dubas has to try his best to sign him next summer. Yeah, and the reason why I also ask this is because I wonder if this is starting to have implications on GMs who are GMs of Canadian teams during the draft when they start to think um, whether or not they should be drafting American-born players if most of them are going to leave after their RFA years are bought up. Like you made a really good point when we talked about the draft in the last episode where you said maybe the Arizona um, the, the Arizona Coyotes just go out and sign, sorry, not sign, draft Cutter Gauthier at three when he should have been going at five or six because he's from Arizona and he might sign back. Mm-hmm. I wonder if this trend continues like in the worst case scenario of Austin Matthews leaves, if these Canadian GMs are now reluctant to start signing American-born players. Yeah, I... I do think it's maybe a little premature to say that, but if this trend continues, you might start to see it for sure. Because, I mean, you can draft the most talented 
American born player, but in this in this world where they're only gonna stick around for like five to six years and not gonna get their very best of them, then maybe that does give GMs pause and they maybe change the way they sort of look at drafting, they change their strategies. I hope it wouldn't come to that because then the Canadian teams would be losing out on a very talented group of players. <laughs> I think it's, we're not far away from the states really being like this the hockey powerhouse just because of the resources and the population that they have. And also the fact that Hockey Canada really isn't that strong at developing players. They're sort mm-hmm. of behind in the way they they, they do things. Um, I could see that happening if this continues to be a trend over maybe the next handful of years. I just hope it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, Austin Matthews, please, for the love of just everything, stay. stay. Just stay. Please. I mean, that would be heartbreaking. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and subscribe for more content and find the link to our full podcast and all our socials in the description down below. Also, don't forget to turn on those notifications to get live updates on new videos that we release.